Peter obviously didn't believe that, but he didn't want to offend them. He was hindering the truth of the gospel to please them. Many Christians do that today, don't they? Maybe not so much adults, but I think adults do that too at workplaces. But when I was a kid, when I was in middle school, I had a youth group, and all the youth group, you adult, you'd have said that all the young ones are really strong Christians because they could quote Bible verses, they knew the Bible like the back of their hand, but as soon as they went to middle school, they would not eat with or hang around with the unpopular kids. I was one of those unpopular kids because I didn't just stop talking about the Bible in church. I also talked about, about the Bible in school. Now, they wouldn't hang around me. They wouldn't want to be around me because I would point out truths of the gospel, truths of the of the effectiveness, I would say that what sin is. I would say homosexuality is sin. I would say that lying is sin. I would keep my brothers and sisters accountable and they just didn't like me. We've all played the hypocrite. And that's a person who says one thing and does another who says there should be unity of believers, but divide ourselves from everyone, who, from everyone who doesn't specifically agree with our particular view. We sometimes believe that we all have to exactly be the same. The kingdom of God was never supposed to be exactly the same because we all come from different cultures. We're not all Jews. We're not all Gentiles. Or something in between. Let's read on. Oh wait. Forgot to mention that this hypocrisy wasn't just at Paul. It was leading all the Jews astray in Antioch, which is a city in Galatia. Now let's read on. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel... I said to Peter before them all, If you, being a Jew, live in the manner of Gentiles, but not as Jews, why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in, Jesus, in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. But when I saw, what does that mean? Immediately when Paul heard about this, he went up to Peter. And it was publicly done. Because everyone was led astray. Usually, if not Everyone's led astray, and it's private sin. You cut, you cut, talk to them privately. But this was public, and it, and everyone was doing it. So Paul had to address the entire group. Why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? They are not part of the Jewish culture. They're not expected to have a Sabbath day. They're not expected to follow Passover and the Jewish feasts. They're not expected to eat kosher pigs. They eat all kinds of things that are not culture, uh, kosher. And you hang around with them. But why do you now separate yourself from them? Why do you tell them to do this now? When before you said Timothy didn't 
uh, Titus didn't need to be circumcised. What does it mean by not sinners of Gentiles? That's talking about their past. Jews were given the law in the beginning. They were given God's oracles, God's prophets, pointing to the time of Christ. But Gentiles were not given this in the beginning. They turned from God at the Tower of Babel. They lived on their entire life not knowing God's oracles. But these, but he's not talking about the Gentile believers. He's talking about the Gentiles in the past. He's talking about where they're coming from. Not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. He knows this. He knows that every sin that you commit is worthy of death. It is. It, that's offensive to most people. And I don't mind being, I, I don't like being offensive, but that's the truth. I'm not rubbing it in anyone's face. I'm telling the truth. The law says that if you commit sin against God, it's worthy of death. No one's justified by the law. No one gets saved by it. All the law did was condemn them. The sacrificial system that was in place with the law covered their sin. It didn't save them. It pushed it back to the time of Christ. Pushed it forward to the time of Christ. We're only saved by submitting to Christ by the faith that leads us to action. Not just the mental ascent, but the faith that leads us to action. Even though we still sin, even though we are not perfect, we still try to war against sin as believers. Now, that, that proposes a question Let's read 17 through 18. If while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are also found sinners. Is Christ therefore a minister of sin? Certainly not. For if I build again those things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. If we were just saved by believing in him and not by submitting to him, yeah, Christ would be a minister of sin, but he's not. He commands us to turn from our sin and submit to him. He commands us to be baptized, which is a symbol representing that. The things which I destroy is sin by turning to Christ, and he destroyed our sin completely on the cross. Let's read on. For through the law, I did. for I through the law died to the law, that I might live in God. Through the law. What does he mean by through the law? Well, Christ died on our behalf. He lived a perfect life. He through the law, he lived a perfect life. There's nothing that could have been counted to him as sin. He even followed all the feast days. He was a Jew by birth. Knew all the oracles of God. Was God himself, actually. And he studied the scriptures as a young child. And he knew all of what the book of the Old Testament, the books of the Old Testament had to say. Submit to God. Turn from your sin and submit to God. That's what it was saying. For there will be a time when, when His anointed one will come and take away all sin. Through 
through the law, I died to the law. What does that mean? It means you died to the oracles, the traditions. The, you don't have to do feast days anymore. They're nice, and they have wisdom. You can do a Passover, but it isn't required anymore. You can eat kosher, but you don't have to eat kosher. God made all things clean to eat. So that I might live to God. When you do this, when you submit to Christ, it makes you a new creation. You're given a new life, a new spirit. It's you were dead and you were brought alive. Let's read on. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. When you have died to this world, when you have repented and been baptized, you're sure you have died to Christ, and, not, and you've died with Christ. You have died to this world. You have died to all the sin. You are decided to war against sin and fight it like an enemy to death. It is no longer I who live. What does that mean? Well. We don't live according to our own wills anymore. What we used to do, what we used to want to do, it isn't an option for us anymore. We have died to that. We have decided to submit to Christ. But Christ lives in me. In you, when, you've had, when you had faith, when you repented, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit. And, and you, it was, that's what it was. You were, it says in the, in the Bible, having believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit. Christ lives in me. You have the Spirit of, the, of, the, of God in you. Of the living God. The one that raised Christ from the dead. The one that did miracles. The third person of the Trinity you have sealed in you. You have God. That's Christ living in you. I live by faith in the Son of God. I mean, we haven't seen it, but we have evidence there. This isn't a blind faith Paul is talking about. But it is a faith, nonetheless, because we haven't seen it. But we have the evidences proving it. And this faith leads us to action. As I said before, it's not just a mental ascent. Faith without works is dead. If you don't do works, you're, you're showing that you might not be a Christian because your works justify your faith. But your works don't justify you. Your faith justifies you. It's a, it's a line. It's an, there's an order to it. So I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. You know, we have the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Three persons, one, one essence, one entity. 
and the second person of the Trinity decided to give that up. He decided to become nothing, become a man for our sake. And that was humiliating, humbling. But he wasn't ashamed of it. He did it willingly. And he was beaten, and he died on a cross. He died, even though he committed no sin. Tortured, even though he committed no sin. Blasphemed, even though he committed no sin. He was even told that he did his miracles by demons. That's the ultimate insult to God. And because of this, God raised him from the dead, which is our hope, which is the assurance of our salvation. And over 500 people saw this. As I said before, this is historically accurate. If, if you were to bring in 500 witnesses that they saw someone raised from the dead and it was in a fair court case, He would have proven that he raised from the dead. He gave himself up for us so we might have eternal life. Amen. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. What does that mean? It means if you could earn salvation by... Being circumcised, following all the ordinances of the law, and following all the feast days, sacrificing your lamb every time you sin. Of course, you can't sin or else you would be condemned. Because there were some cases where you couldn't be saved by committing an animal sacrifice. But Christ forgives all sin. If he, if, the, if we could be saved through the law, then Christ didn't have to die. He'd be sitting up there just letting everyone go to heaven. Or letting those who are perfect go to heaven. But no one's perfect, are they? Well, Peter and Paul finally worked out their differences. I'm pretty sure Peter took this rebuke and said, You're right, Paul. I'm sorry. I was wrong. Because they didn't hold grudges against each other. You see, Peter also wrote in the Bible too. Paul wasn't the only one. 2 Peter 3, 11 through 16 says, Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? Looking for and hastening the coming of the day of the Lord, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. No, nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace without spot and blameless. And consider that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, that also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you. As do all, as do in all his epistles, speaking in them of things in which 
are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they also, as they do also the rest of the scriptures. The rest of the scriptures. Peter recognized that what Paul was saying was true. It was right. It was completely right because he was inspired by the Holy Spirit and this was scripture. God's word. To those who do not believe in our Lord Jesus Christ, let me repeat again. You cannot get to heaven by doing good works. The law actually does condemn you. If you've ever lied, stolen, cheated, had a had a committed adultery in your heart, anything, you deserve to go to hell because you sinned against God. I'm not trying to be mean. I'm not judging you. I'm saying if you have done this, you will. But there's good news. You don't have to go there. You know why? Because God sent His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die on a cross for our sin. For this, bearing all the weight of sin and death that, so that anyone who has faith in Him will have eternal life. All you need to do is die to your former way of life and submit to Christ. And symbolize it, be baptized. If you submit to Christ, you will have the Holy Spirit enjoying your heart, giving you new desires. Please repent. Pray to God. Plead with Him. Lord, I don't want to live this life anymore. Anymore, I don't want to live this life of sin and death. I want to have a new life and submit to You. You are my Savior. That is is a gospel. That's good news. Pray, and you'll get it. God's a merciful God. Now I'm not going to. I'm not going to send you to hell. I'm not going to kill you to prove my point that God exists. God exists, whether you believe it or not. This is true, whether you believe it or not. Please, I love you, and I want you to come to Christ. Those who believe, we need to stick together. Encourage the whole body, no matter what they look like. No matter some of the quirky things they do, as long as it's not sinful. Let's not look down on other believers who are different from us. And let's share this gospel message. The one that the Bible says to all who will listen. Please do this. That's the only way the kingdom will grow, is if we preach God's word. Is if how can, how else can they come to Christ if we don't preach it? If we don't tell them of it? We need to live our lives as an example showing this. And we need to tell them of this. There's no other way. But I know you all who have a heart for Christ, who love, to, who love His Word, will do this because you love God and you want others to have the grace that's been given to you. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for sin. That we have no more separation from you. That we are in your people. That we don't have to become Jews in order to become Christians. Thank you that we can have eternal life by, through faith in you. Please, please change the unbelievers' hearts. Grow us to share the gospel with them. 
Let us encourage our brothers and sisters who are new in the faith. We may not personally like tattoos or piercings, but we do love them and we do recognize them as brothers. I don't want to condemn them for their choice. That's a personal choice to do that. Help us to be your admin, your ministers. Help us to be your priests. Help us to be our, your ambassadors. And I just bring all this before you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.